Hi students and welcome to chapter 7. This is an interesting chapter. Delivering bad news messages, particularly at work, requires a lot of tact. It's one of the more difficult messages that we have to communicate in the business arena. We certainly don't want to follow the drill sergeant in the picture here that's yelling at his people. We want to deliver these messages with tact. These are situations where oftentimes we're going to have to continue working with the people or maintain the relationship with the customer. So we want to deliver the bad news, but we want to do it tactfully. And I'm going to be walking you through a five-step process to maximize the effectiveness of your bad news messages so that they're understood without a lot of drama on the back end. Now, bad news messages, we're going to be following the inductive method. So the last message, we we're using the deductive message method, which is basically start with the main idea and then provide some supporting details. With the inductive method, which we're going to use for the bad news message this week, you want to lead up to the main idea. And the main idea is that you're delivering the bad news. Oftentimes, you're denying a request or uh, not giving a customer something that they want. All right, so there's five steps. Let's cover a few things, and then we'll get down to the actual five-step process. Outcomes. I've put in bold the two that I'm going to focus on primarily. There are six here. So please read through these learning outcomes and I'll be ticking off these boxes as I go through the slides. So the specific type of message that I'm going to be referring to is, is refusing a request. So you see that in your third bullet point. It's not bulleted, it's not bold here, but that's the specific type of written message that we're going to be focusing on for our bad news delivery. I'm also going to be giving you some pointers on crisis communication, not necessarily directly from the textbook, but this is stuff from my own professional career on, on crisis communication that I think you'll find helpful. Now, it goes without saying that when we're delivering bad news messages, what do you think is the best way to deliver a bad news message? The best way to deliver a bad news message is face to face. So that would always be our first choice because we have all of our communication tools available to us and it's less likely to end up with bad feelings, misunderstandings, and it's the best way to deliver your bad news messages. On this slide, you have your key terms. So how to write a bad news message. And you see the five steps there of buffer, reasons, bad news, alternate solutions, and a positive close. So I'm gonna walk you through that, and that's the five-step process for a written bad news message, but it also serves if you're delivering it face-to-face -face or video, whatever your format, those are the five steps. We're also gonna cover some tips on how to deliver bad news to employees. And my favorite part is crisis communication, what to do when when the stuff hits the fan at work and you're the person who has to get up and speak on behalf of the organization for the crisis, sometimes that involves talking to the media. All right, so let's dive in. So there's an embedded video here, and if you're watching this as a YouTube video, you'll need to click on the link up above, but I encourage you to do it. It's, it's about six minutes. It's good for a laugh. It's entertaining. And these are some classic breakup scenes from movies. And in some respects, delivering bad news is kind of like breaking up with somebody, which is certainly a bad news message and why I gave you guys this video to watch. So you are um, looking to walk a very fine line in the delivery of a bad news message. You don't want it to be so soft that the person doesn't really receive the message. Oh, it's not because of you, it's me, let's be friends. And you're not clear that you're breaking up with that person in the case of that example, then they're not gonna get that message and they might continue to reach out and contact you because you weren't very clear about delivering the bad news message, it was too soft. You could break up with somebody and it could be on the other side. You could be very firm. I don't like you. I don't want to see you anymore. Lose my number, right? That would certainly get the message across, but that's probably too blunt of a way of delivering the bad news. So we're trying to thread the middle here. 
where we're going to be gentle in our delivery and yet the bad news is going to be received and understood and hopefully the recipient of the bad news will go away with some level of understanding and the matter won't be recycling itself again. So take a minute and watch that video. And I opened up the slide with a question, who's received a bad news message that was delivered poorly? Maybe you can add some examples of this in your discussion board and your uh, discussion post this week. We've all been there, right? We've all received bad news. You're fired. You didn't get the job you want. You get broken up with. You name it. And some folks handle this with great tact and others don't. So let's learn the secrets of how to do this right. But first up, check out that video on uh, bad news messages from the movie scenes. I think you'll enjoy it. So in business, the best way to deliver bad news, if you always have your choice, is to deliver it face to face, as I was mentioning at the opening of this lecture. So the channel would be face to face. If you're firing somebody, if you're giving somebody a negative performance review, you want to do that face to face. However, what if you have to tell the entire company that you're relocating the manufacturing plant from San Diego, which is expensive, to a small town in Tennessee, which is much less expensive? Can you meet each person face to face? You can't. You can maybe do a large company meeting and get a lot of them, but you're going to have to follow up with probably some written components as well. So we don't always have the option of going face to face, but however, when we can, we should go face to face. And I'm stressing that because oftentimes with all the electronic messaging options we have with text and email and video, it can get very easy to avoid face to face. And if we want to avoid a difficult conversation and we decide to use a different channel than face to face, that's a skill that we want to develop when we want to actually learn to have the difficult conversations in a face-to-face -face format. You will receive more respect and you'll come across as more compassionate and authentic if you can go with a face-to-face -face delivery of bad news. Okay, but that's not always the case. So your assignment this week is going to be writing a bad news message, basically denying a customer a request that they're making of the company and you're going to have to send them a letter. And this is a type of form letter that you would send out to lots and lots of customers uh, who are asking for certain requests. So that's the type of message you're going to be crafting this week. So as I mentioned in the prior slide, that last bullet point here, is you really want to tread with caution when delivering bad news in an electronic format. And if possible, avoid it. If you can't physically be with that person face to face, can you do a live video call with that person? That way, at least they can see your face and you're having the discussion that way. If you can't do that, can you at least have a phone call with the person? What you don't want to do is, you know, we're firing this person. Let's cut them loose, send them an email or send them a text. Uh, you want to avoid that. Why? Because when we deliver bad news, you know, people's feelings are involved here and you don't want to deliver your bad news in a channel that's not going to be received well, because what's going to happen is the recipient of the bad news is going to become upset and then you're going to have to deal with a whole separate issue in communication, which is dealing with an upset employee or an upset customer at that point. If you can pick the right channel and the right message, the recipient of the bad news will go away. But if you don't pick the right channel and if your message isn't correct, then you're actually going to escalate the issue and you're going to have to spend more time delivering the bad news, which is not what we want to do. So uh, don't hide behind electronic formats when you have the option to make a phone call or do a live video or ideally see the person uh, live in person. So with bad news messages and also next week when we do the sales message, we're going to be using the inductive approach. That means we lead up to the main idea. And the reasons for the bad news are actually going to precede the bad news. We would never have a bad news message where we say, we're denying your request for credit is the opening line. And then you give them the reasons. No, you actually got to kind of 
fluff the pillows and have that bad news sandwich and lead up to that piece. So, you know, the question I'm asking you here is what happens to the receiver, the listener, if you use the deductive direct approach when you're delivering bad news? If they just hit you square in the face right off the bat, I'm sorry to say we're, let, we're letting you go from the company, right? If that's the first information you receive, you're going to get defensive. You're going to get upset. And like I said earlier, the situation is going to escalate itself. So by being tactful and starting with the buffer and then getting to the reasons and then delivering the bad news and then having an alternate solution, you have a much higher chance of the recipient of the bad news accepting the bad news. And that's our goal. Our goal as business people, when we deliver messages, is we want to deliver them once. We want to craft a quality message in the right format, the right channel, have it be received and have it be executed. In other words, the recipient of that message does what they need to do. If it's a direct request message, they do what we're requesting them to do. If it's a bad news message, they accept the bad news and they go away and they don't bother us anymore. If it's a sales message, they take action on what we're asking them to do perhaps an order or perhaps booking a meeting. So the goal is to send the message out once and not have to communicate one issue multiple times. And the area where you're most likely to have to keep communicating an issue is around bad news messages. So this one is, is the most difficult to get right the first time. All right, so let's talk about the inductive steps. So the inductive process and all of your written messages are going to have an open and a body and a close, at least three paragraphs. And in the opening of a bad news message, you see here it says begins with a neutral idea that leads to the refusal or bad news. I call this, and the book calls this as well, a buffer. A buffer is a neutral point of agreement with no hint, no inference of the bad news itself. A one size fit all buffer statement that I like to use that works when you're dealing with customers is what I call a consideration buffer. And a consideration buffer is simply a simple sentence and it's a, your opening paragraph and it's a one sentence paragraph. And it says something along the lines of, thank you for letting us know about your situation. We've reviewed your request and given it careful consideration. Not saying yes, not saying no, right? So we've reviewed your request and given it careful consideration. Let's the recipient of the message, the person who is asking for the thing that they want, you're letting them know, I listen to you. I, I, I listened to your complaint or, you know, I heard what you had to say and I've given it careful consideration. That alone as an opening statement can take some of the heat out of the situation at hand. So people just want to be heard, right? So if they know they're heard first, then they're going to be more receptive to listening to your reasons and ultimately delivering the bad news in a way that's digestible to them. So you're going to have a buffer in the opening. And then in the body, that's where you're going to be working the reasons. The reasons are stated neutrally. There's no apology. Uh, there's no blame or accusation in the tone. And they're just simple reasons that really support your third step, which is the delivery of the bad news, which is said just one time without apology. It's at the end of the reasons. Also in the body is, you see item three here, a counter proposal, uh, what we call an alternate solution. What we can do for you is, so you try to throw the customer a bone. You try to extend the olive branch with, even though you're saying no to what they want, you're giving them something that you can do for them. You want to be careful here because in business, you're not trying to like, we're going to give you money or we're going to give you a refund. Well, that's kind of giving them what they want, right? So uh, this alternate solution is your step four of your five steps. And then your step five in the closing, you're going to not talk about the refusal of this all. You're not going to say something like, once again, we apologize. Or if there's anything else we can do, please contact us. You don't want any further contact. You don't want to continue offering uh, your email and phone number for the customer to contact you and recycle the information. So what do you want? You want them to go away. 
You want them to receive the bad news and go away. And that's the goal of a bad news message. So it's forward looking in the close, it's positive, and it does not have contact information. All right, let's get into how to do that. So at the top of this slide, you see the five steps of the bad news message. So these essentially are kind of your paragraph order for a bad news letter. Your very first paragraph is going to be that buffer. What do you need in a buffer? You need no mention of the bad news, and it's just a neutral statement. It's like, isn't it a sunny day today? You wouldn't say that, but if you were talking with somebody live, you can come up with some type of neutral point of agreement uh, to kind of, uh, you know, soften the person up before you get to delivering the bad news. As I mentioned before, uh, I like the consideration buffer. Thank you for letting us know of your situation. We've reviewed your request and given it careful consideration. Let's assume, as I talk about the five steps for the bad news message delivery, let's assume that you work for Apple and that you're a customer service manager and you handle all the emails, your department handles all the emails that come in from customers wanting things from Apple. My phone broke, I want a replacement. Uh, this isn't working, I want something back. My tablet crashed, all these kind of things. So, you know, you probably also have a call center and a lot of this would be handled live, but let's assume that the next step from a call center, if they were to escalate their issue, is that they would send an email to you with their request for something. And you, as the customer service manager, after reading their request, have to tell them no. So this is delivering bad news to a customer, and we want to do this tactfully. We want them to understand the bad news. They're not going to like it, but they're going to understand it and go away. So my buffer, so let's assume that uh, you get an email from a customer and they're saying, my iPhone stopped working and I would like a replacement. And so you get that email and you're going to start with a buffer response, a buffer in the opening of your bad news delivery. And the reason you're delivering bad news is because you can't give them a new phone because the iPhone that they purchased is out of warranty. It's beyond warranty. So way past warranty, you can't just give them a new phone. They're going to have to go get it repaired. So your opening buffer would be something along the lines of, thank you, Le thank you for contacting us regarding your iPhone. We've reviewed your request and given it careful consideration. That's it. There's no mention of the warranty or that you're not going to give them the bad news. It's just a neutral point of agreement. That's a buffer. That's your opening paragraph. And then we get into paragraph two, reasons. Paragraph two. Here at Apple, we, we care about quality products. That's why we back all of our iPhones with a six-month no-fault warranty. Because your product is beyond the warranty date, we cannot honor your request for a new iPhone. So what you heard me deliver there was the reasons and the bad news. I wouldn't deliver the reasons with something along the lines of your warranty clearly states that returns are only provided in the first six months. That's true, but that's blaming language that doesn't make the customer any happier. So we just deliver the reasons neutrally. They're just neutral. They're just stating the facts. At the end of the reasons, we deliver the bad news. And we do it without apology. Why? Because we're not doing anything wrong. We don't, there's no apology needed. It wouldn't be, we're sorry, but we can't give you a new iPhone. That doesn't really make the person feel any better. So you just want to have the reasons, have them be strong, justification, neutrally stated for why you can't honor the request. And then the very last sentence in your reasons paragraph is the delivery of the bad news. You would not want the bad news to be in its separate paragraph, all bold, all caps. No, 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 don't do that. It's just the very last sentence in your reasons. Normally you'll have several reasons. I gave you just one for this short example. All right, so that's Apple. We thank them for letting us know about their situation. We reviewed it and gave it careful consideration. We mentioned that we care about quality products. That's why we back them all with a six-month warranty. Because your product is beyond warranty, we cannot honor your request for a refund. So now we're going to move into step four, alternate solutions. 
and in alternate solutions, we want to try to give the customer something to keep them happy uh, without something like, hey, we're offering you a, a, a voucher for 10% off your next purchase or bring it, into, bring it into a local iPhone store and we'll repair your phone for free. Well, that's, that's not really delivering any bad news, right? So the alternate solution is what can you give the customer that doesn't cost you as a company any money? So think about Apple for a second and a customer who's getting a bad news message that we can't replace your broken iPhone. What can you give them as an alternate solution? Can you think of anything? Well, what if in our email we said, uh, for these reasons, we cannot honor your request for a, a new iPhone. What we can do is provide you with a list of repair shops in your area. So that's an alternate solution. I'm giving you very short sentences here. Your letters are going to have a lot more meat to them than this. And then you're very closing in your last paragraph, your positive close, no contact information. Thank, thank you for contacting Apple. We hope we can serve you again. We hope we can be of service to you again in the future. So something neutral in the closing, right? So you wouldn't want a super saccharine, overly positive close. Thank you again for being a customer of Apple. We care about our customers and we hope that you'll understand our situation, right? That's a bunch of cliches that aren't going to make the customer feel any better. So positive close, no contact information. Why? You're going to want to apologize in that end. We're so sorry. And if you have any other questions, please contact me. You're going to want to give them contact information. No, you don't want to do that. Why? Because then they're just going to keep contacting you. And that's not delivering the bad news. That is recycling the bad news. So positive close, no contact information. Now, it, this is an email, right? So in the subject line, should your subject line say something regarding your request for a new iPhone or denial of your iPhone replacement request? No, because that's putting the bad news right up front in the subject line, right? So the order of a bad news message, in this case a letter, is paragraph one, you have a buffer. Paragraph two, or two and three, if there's a lot of reasons, you have your reasons. At the very end of that par reasons paragraph, you deliver the bad news. You deliver it just once without any apology. Paragraph three, or paragraph four, if your reasons are long, you give them an alternate solution, something that you can do for the customer so they feel like you at least you know, tried to help them out a little bit. Paragraph four, your positive close, no contact information, short and sweet. That's your bad news message. So no, you would not include anything referring to the bad news in the subject line when you're delivering bad news in an email format. Now, there are some, some situations when you can use a direct approach for bad news. If you're in a meeting and you need to demonstrate authority and you're the final say on a situation that's uh, being debated, if you really know the person well, uh, you have a relationship with that person, um, then authenticity is warranted. You're going to sit and say, look, Jim, you didn't get the promotion. Let me explain why. You wouldn't sit down with Jim, who's someone you've worked with for years. You know, we had a lot of excellent candidates. We had to review blankety blank resumes. If you know the person well and you're sitting them down, and you're not getting to the bad news right away, then it's actually more harmful. So when you do know the person well, you can go with the deductive approach. And a third would be when the bad news is expected. An example there would be if you interviewed for a job and you never heard back from the company and then you got a letter from them two weeks later, you can assume that the letter is a thanks for interviewing us with us. We chose an applicant who had more experience, we'll keep your resume on file, right? So in that case, you can go uh, direct because the bad news is expected. If we're going to get the job after an interview, they wouldn't send us a letter. They would call us. So we know that the letter, when it's received, is already the bad news, right? So here's a couple of buffer statements. 
Which one do you think is best? You can go ahead and pause the video for a minute. Okay, that was me pausing. Which one do you think is best? I like the first version. So this is kind of denying a request that maybe they want you to come uh, volunteer for an organization. The second one, regrettably, that goes straight into the bad news, right? So the first one has a neutral opener. The third one is also neutral in the opening, but it's a little long. So I think the first version one is the best here as far as a buffer. So the buffer is a neutral point of agreement. And as I told you, the consideration buffer is my favorite one size fit all buffer. There's other examples in the book. Then you go with the next paragraph or section of the letter. It could be more than one paragraph. We have the reasons. Smooth transition. There's no accusation or blame. You're just delivering the facts. You don't want to state company policy. The reasons are neutral in delivery, but they do kind of imply the bad news. And then you position the bad news. It's stated at the end of the reasons. There's no apology, it's not necessary. And you position the bad news statement strategically. What do we mean by that? It means it's not its own paragraph, it's not bold. It's gonna be delivered at the end of the reasons section. So you just say it and you only say it once. So here's a couple of bad news messages. This is step three of your five steps of a bad news message. Going from harsh to softer top to bottom the first one is harsh second one's a little more neutral the third one we're not able to release the requested information due to privacy laws that prohibit disclosure so that's the softest delivery again the unfortunately is after you've delivered the reasons if you had something such as uh, regretfully or unfortunately and you had that at the start of your reasons paragraph, well, that's kind of implying the bad news. Cause like, wait a minute, if you're saying, un unfortunately, your Apple, your iPhone was beyond the warranty period, that already kind of implies the bad news. So you just say your iPhone is beyond the warranty period. Therefore, unfortunately, we cannot honor your request for a refund. So does that understand the difference? So some of these modifier phrases, like unfortunately and regretfully, uh, if you had them as part of the reasons, it would imply the bad news too early. Buffer, reasons, neutral, then the bad news. Then the alternate solution. So this is a counter proposal. What can we do to save face with the customer and give them some kind of silver lining that uh, th they can get something without it costing you as a company any money? For example, if you denied somebody a job that they interviewed for, your resume will be kept on file for consideration is our alternate solution. Or if you had to let somebody go at work, Please take advantage of the outsourcing services offered by our company. Um, this product that you're looking to order is on back order, but this is a replacement that many people find acceptable, right? So all these are alternate solutions. If we go back to Apple, that alternate solution, here's a list of repair shops in the area that can help you repair your phone. All right, so let's move on and talk about delivering live bad news when you got the recipient of the bad news right in front of you. So here's another movie to kind of bring the point home. This is George Clooney in the movie Up in the Air, and he is a consultant, and he's the guy that companies bring in when the company is downsizing and they have to lay off a lot of people. He does the dirty work for them of firing people. So you're gonna see this scene where he's firing a series of people and my question to you is, what stage of the bad news is George Clooney at in this scene when he gets to the gentleman who used to be a chef and he's uh, delivering him some bad news? What stage is he going for in the bad news process? I'll take a minute and pause and wait for your response. OK, so you watch the video and yes, there's some bad language in this video, but He's at the alternate solution stage, right? So 
He's delivered the buffer. We didn't see that part. He's delivered the reasons. And now he's getting to the alternate solution. You can be a chef again and follow your actual dreams. So the alternate solution is an important step in the bad news process. The last step, closing positively. We want to be careful here. They're not happy and we shouldn't be too happy, but we want to demonstrate some empathy. We don't want to talk about the bad news anymore. And we want to have some type of uplifting, unifying close to our bad news message. So it should be positive and it should be forward looking. So how do we do that? Well, one way to help us with that is to make sure we don't the th do the things you see on this slide. You don't want to re-reference the bad news. We're really sorry that we had to lay you off. You don't want to have any shallow or trite state statements. We really care about our customers. This was a really hard decision to make. If we can be of further help, do not hesitate to call. No, we're delivering bad news. So those are kind of trite statements that are actually going to make the recipient more upset. So you just want to deliver, a, you know, thank, thank you for your business. We look forward to serving you again in the future. Something along those lines that's not overly positive and not referring to the bad news again. Okay. okay. So this is an example of the steps involved in refusing a request. Maybe somebody's asking you to speak at their event or be a volunteer or sit on their board or something important in the business realm, and you have to say no. Now, the example I'll use for this is my 16-year-old son just got his first job over the summer, and he's a bagger and a clerk at a local grocery store. And I come and visit him from time to time, and I came in and visited him when he was on his break so that we could go grab something to eat. And as he's walking back to the break room, a customer stopped him and asked him where minced garlic was. And he'd been there about a week. And his response was, I'm sorry, I don't know. <laughs> and, he, and he kept on walking. And the customer was kind of like, uh, what? I don't understand. So me as a business communications instructor, I was cringing as I watched that exchange happen. And so later on, I was talking, I said, you know, you got to follow the bad news format when you're refusing a request. What you should have said to the customer was, gosh, you know, those that, that's that's a tough item to find. I know that's a tough item to find in this store. You know, actually, I'm on my lunch break, so I can't help you. I can't help you right now. But I can, I'll walk you over to the customer service desk and they can find, they can help direct you to that item. I actually don't know where it is. So that mixes in a couple of the bad news message delivery items. First is a buffer. Yeah, that's a difficult item to find in this store. Some acknowledgement of the customer situation. And then getting into the reasons. I'm actually on my lunch break. So, and then delivering the bad news. So I can't help you right now. Bad news, alternate solution, but I can walk you over to the customer service desk and they can help you find that item, right? So just a short little change in the delivery uh, has big results with how, un how happier the customer is. Another difficult area in bad news, and you'll be delivering a lot of this in business, is constructive criticism. How do we deliver criticism to the person without them getting defensive and upset? The first thing when we have to deliver constructive criticism is we have to be committed to delivering that constructive criticism. And if you think about it, if you are avoiding giving somebody constructive criticism, you're basically giving some implied acceptance of that behavior. Now, here's where it goes wrong in a work situation. If you're managing people, and say you have one employee who consistently arrives late or they're consistently not dressed appropriately for the job. If you don't say anything to that employee, 
you have now implied your consent, thereby allowing the rest of your employees to lower their standards. And pretty soon you'll have multiple employees um, exhibiting that same behavior. So if you want to motivate your good employees, make sure that folks who are not up to standard are getting feedback on that. You know, I, I remember as a new manager, I had a employee that just was doing a horrible job and tried as we did. We couldn't get the employee to perform and I finally had to fire that employee. And the productivity in my department went way up after that person was fired. So you have to have some standards here. You have to be willing to deliver constructive feedback to people, but you want to do it in a way that it's going to be received. The first thing you want to do is you want to make sure that you're focusing on the behavior, not the person. Focus on the behavior that you want to change, not the person. If you want someone to show up to work on time, you'd be talking about, you seem disorganized and lazy. That's a personal attack versus the behavior. I need you to show up to work on time. I need you to manage your time better so that you can be on time for work. That's the behavior, not the personal attack on the person. You also want, um, so you want to have that intent and you want to start with things that they're doing well. Hey, I really appreciate how you've been um, restocking the grocery section has been looking fantastic on your shifts. And I, I really appreciate the detail that you're putting into stocking the, the grocery section of the store. I want to talk about you being late at work routinely, right? So that's, that's getting into that. It should start with something that they're doing well, and then talk about what they need to do well. And then close on a positive note, assuming that they're going to perform the, the new thing. So give them something that they're doing well, talk about the behaviors that need to change, and then end on a positive note. It can really be that simple. And don't sit on constructive feedback that needs to be delivered, especially if you're a manager. All right, so let's look at an example of a written bad news message. So in this case, we have a company that it has to relocate their manufacturing plant from New York to Tennessee. And they have to send this message out to their thousands of employees who work at that plant and letting them know that they're relocating the plant. And all these employees will need to relocate or they won't have a job. So this is obviously bad news. But go ahead and take a minute and read through this letter. And then I'll recap some of the things that they did well after you read it through. So this is two pages. It's actually this page and the next slide to read the full letter. But go ahead and read just this first slide first, and then I'll give you some comments. Take a minute now to read those first three paragraphs. Okay, so let's assume you read that. And uh, you see in the opening, they talk about our companies thrive by taking advantage of international business opportunities. So that's just a neutral buffer as a point of agreement. And then the next two paragraphs are reasons that are building a case with a rational explanation of what they're going to deliver in the next slide, the actual bad news about relocating the plant. So they're talking about in that second paragraph how their New York, their New York City facility isn't capable of, of being expanded. Uh, they talk about in paragraph three how there's high property taxes and transportation costs and that there's a need to consider alternate sites. See, these are just listed as reasons. They're neutral, but it's starting to infer the bad news. So if you're in a manufacturing, you know, if you're an assembly line worker in the manufacturing plant and you're reading this letter by paragraph three, you're like, this doesn't sound good, right? So they're starting to worry that they might be getting the actual bad news. So then we get into the next slide. And here in that first paragraph, which is paragraph four of the letter, you can see they end the reasons with the bad news. These factors have convinced us that moving the manufacturing facility to Franklin, Tennessee would benefit the company and employees. So they deliver the bad news. We're relocating. 
Then we would expect to see alternate solutions, which you see in the next paragraph. Your supervisor will explain the logistics. So this doesn't have the closing part, but and then the very last sentence, now let us all work together for a smooth transition to Franklin would be your positive close. And that should actually be its own separate paragraph. So nice job in this example of walking through the bad news message. This is a good letter for you to look at to kind of understand the tonality and the flow of a bad news message. And this is similar to what you'll be doing for your written assignment this week. The last piece I want to talk about from this chapter is crisis communication. What to do when the stuff hits the fan and you're the person at work who has to deal with a crisis. So <clears throat> first off, you want to have a CCP. That's a crisis communication plan. That basically spells out in the event of a crisis, who's going to deal with all the stakeholders? Who's going to deal with the media and the public about this situation? Think of a company like uh, you know, Volkswagen, not too many years ago, had Dieselgate, where they had uh, falsified all their EPA smog emissions on their product tests and overstated uh, how clean their their um, clean diesel line of cars were. They're completely falsified. So you have to decide who's going to talk to the media in this situation. As a company, under the do column up top there, the first thing you want to do is apologize. Apologize. Neutrally, uh, we're very sorry for this situation. And I say neutrally because you still haven't had your day in court where all this has been sorted out. So you wouldn't want to say, we're sorry that we falsified our records. And you just kind of want to have a neutral buffer apology. You do want to tell the facts. Here's what we know has happened. Um, because the media is researching and trying to get this information from a variety of sources. So if you're covering up facts that might be known by others, you're going to get skewered on TV. You want to move to solutions quickly. So here's what we're doing as a company. Look at politicians when they get interviewed. The reporter will ask them a question and they'll move completely over to something else. They'll pivot and move on to solutions. So. The media wants to keep you in the mud with uh, what's going wrong, and you as a company want to try to focus on here's what we're doing to make the situation right. So that's in the do column. What you don't want to do is speculate, oh, we're not sure if it was uh, one of our suppliers that had a faulty uh, uh, exhaust systems that caused these, nu these numbers to be off. You don't want to shift blame to another supplier. Uh, you don't want to name names. You certainly don't want to pitch products or services. And let me just close by giving an example. When I worked at Petco, we had over 500 stores across the United States. Uh, big operations. We had grooming in all of our stores. That's a lot of grooming salons to have. And with that many stores, on occasion, it would happen that a pet would die while it was under our care being groomed at our store. Oftentimes it was an elderly pet that just couldn't handle the stress of being groomed. Sometimes they would break loose from their restraints. If it was a giant bull mastiff or something and they would get out and run away from the store. Uh, if the grooming is stressful for some animals and they might get hit and killed out in the parking lot. Um, uh, and some animals, sadly, uh, it was from employee negligence and they were left in the drying station too long and the animal expired from dehydration. So all of these are terrible situations. And uh, we did have this situation for Petco that it was kind of small and a little, one of our small little regional offices, they had a store that um, had an animal die while being groomed and the customers were obviously upset and they went to the media and it became a news story. And I had to work with the communications director on how we were gonna handle uh, going in front of the media. And I've had to do crisis communication at other companies. And there's something about when that red light goes on and the media is there interviewing you and you realize I'm going to be on TV in a bad way. <laughs> uh, you want to try to uh, stick to the crisis communication steps. You don't speculate. If it was PECO, you wouldn't want to say, you know, we're not sure why the animal was in the drying station so long. Our drying stations have an automatic shutoff switch that apparently was faulty. So we're contacting the Acme dryer company to see if it's a problem with their shutoff switches. 
even if that was true, it's not something you would communicate in a crisis communication situation. The public knows that the animal died while it was under your care at Petco, right? So you don't want to speculate. You don't want to shift blame to a different company. You don't want to name names. You know, the employee in question, our grooming manager, Nate Scharf, uh, apparently was on an extended lunch break and wasn't managing uh, the grooming salon when this happened. So he's been fired. So you want to be careful about naming actual people in the company. You want to say the person involved, the employee involved in the situation has been put on administrative leave pending further investigation. Because what if Nate was actually innocent and it wasn't him? Well, now he's going to sue you because you uh, slandered him on TV. You don't want to pitch products or services at the end. So that might be your alternate close or your positive close. So despite the recent tragedy at our grooming salons and in an attempt to uh, reinstall customer confidence with our, our grooming operations. For the month of September, we're going to be offering 50% off a dip and clip at all of our Petco grooming salons. We care about pets at Petco. You wouldn't want to take that media time with the crisis to try to pitch products or services or the company. You want to be brief, you want to be sincere, and you want to be seated. So try to make it short and sweet. Okay, my friends, that is it on bad news. I know that was a lot of information on this lecture. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.